And as I have been guilty of often recently, we're going to have a lot of verses today. So don't try and get all of them written down. Just try and get the idea of them. Galatians 5, verses 24 through 27. Uh... Okay, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. This is not the verses I was looking for. Um, How about 22 and 23? I don't know why I wrote the wrong verses down there. Um, well, well, actually, let's go back to, uh, to 16 and read through 23. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for they are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warned you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And 1 Corinthians 9, starting in verse, well, that's what I did. I mixed up the, verse, the end verses on these passages. 1 Corinthians 9, starting in verse 24, and here we will read through 27. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the body of Christ. We thank you for uh, the greatness of your character and of your attributes that you have revealed to us in Scripture that give us a framework and a structure to operate under as a church, that we exist for your glory, that it is all informed by your word. Father, bring us through your word to high views of you and to an understanding of the absolute authority of scripture and to right doctrine and right thinking. And I pray that as we go through this series, you would continue to show us just how crucial right thinking and right doctrine is to our state of mind and state of heart. Father, as we continue to look at spiritual attributes or spiritual attitudes, rather, that you have called us to, to build a healthy church, to focus on the inner man rather than just the programs that we perform and function, but that we would seek to have health in our hearts as individuals and thusly to have health as a church. Father, we have so much to be thankful for here, for each other, for your word, for the freedom to worship, for the Holy Spirit by which we can know that you are true and by which we can know what your son has done for us. Father, thank you for calling us out of darkness and into 
your marvelous light. Use uh, your word today, not only to enthrall us with you and with your greatness, uh, but to bring peace and thankfulness to our hearts. And I ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, I wanna dive right in today to these spiritual attributes. I wanna try and get through three of them. And I think uh, some of the ones we've gone through recently have taken more time, but I'm going to try and move a little faster, uh, and I want to be a little more brief. So hopefully we'll make it through all three of these spiritual attitudes that a church must develop. We saw first and foremost, by way of review again, and it should be on your notes in your, uh, in your bulletin there, that we saw first, and I think foremost when it comes to attitudes, the attitude of obedience. This is the sine qua non of these attributes. This is the most important. Uh, if we do not have obedience to the, the word of God, the rest of these will fall short. Secondly, we saw that we must have humility that sees the needs of others. Thirdly, love that meets those needs. Unity as we are brought together under the purpose of glorifying God. Service as we serve God by serving the body of Christ and joy. And we're going to see some overlap between some of what we see today and some of those, but I think that's okay. Today we're going to look at the next three, and that is peace, thankfulness, and I have joy written down here as my third attribute, but that is not true at all. It is peace, thankfulness, and self discipline. What do you do? You have self discipline in your bulletin? Oh, good. Okay, I'm glad you have the right thing. I just made a hot mess of my notes this week, apparently. Uh, let's start out with peace. But before we can begin talking about what biblical peace is, we need a common working definition. I think the, the way peace most often gets used, particularly in the news and in political discussions, is a lack of war. And certainly peace would be a lack of war. But I believe peace to be so much more than just a lack of war or a lack of conflict, especially biblical peace. Eerdman's Bible Dictionary defines peace as this, a state of wholeness and security, embracing both the physical and spiritual dimensions and relating not only to the individual, but also to the entire community and relationships among persons. Let me read that again, and before I do, I want you to see two aspects here. I want you to see that biblical peace has horizontal implications. That there is not just peace. If we were to look at Ephesians, and we will, in fact, go ahead and turn there, because that's where we're going next. Turn to Ephesians 2. What we're going to see is that biblical peace has a horizontal aspect between people and a vertical aspect between man and God. And the first, the horizontal, is always related to and derived from the vertical. That being said, let me see if I can read this again and if you might be able to pick up some of this. I think the definition is great if complicated. Again, the definition is a state of wholeness and security. A state of wholeness and security. Embracing both the physical and the spiritual dimensions. And relating not only to the individual, but also to the entire community and relationships among persons. Follow along this line of thought in Ephesians 2, starting at 11. Therefore... Remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, that is Jews, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you at that time, you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. There's both dimensions, separated from Christ and alienated to Israel. Both dimensions are right there, vertical and horizontal alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And then we have two words. Two words, actually it's one word that is hugely important in the book of Ephesians. And that is but. 
uh, if you move up to verse 4, you can see, but God. Uh, David Martin Lloyd-Jones preached eight years through the book of Ephesians, week in and week out. And one sermon that he preached was entirely on these two words, but God. It is the hinge of the book of Ephesians. You're dead in your trespasses and sins. You are guilty. You are dead men. Are, you know, dead men are just well, exactly what they are. They're dead, lifeless. We are lifeless. And then in two words, Paul just lights up the book of Ephesians with, but God, and praise God for the words, but God. And here we see something similar as well. Having been separated, having division and no peace vertically and horizontally, but now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, which starts with the vertical, who has made us both one and moves to the horizontal and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Peace is a state of wholeness and security that extends in the church both between people and between God and man. Here is my working definition of peace. As I've tried to distill this down, here's my definition. Peace is calmness of heart and mind knowing that God is in control of all things and that he is good. Peace is the calmness of heart and mind, knowing that God is in control of all things and that he is good. I think this is exactly the point Paul makes in Romans 8, 28, a verse that gets used uh, incredibly often. But we know that God works all things to the good of those who are called according to his purposes. Well, what, what do we see there? We see not only the sovereignty of God, that God works all things, but that he works all things to good. It would not be a comforting thought to, to think about a sovereign God who is in control of all things and who is not good. That would be a horrifying reality. That would be the absolute lack of peace. That would be to live in terror, but no, we believe that peace is both the calmness of heart and of mind, knowing that God is in control of all things and that he is good. It is the rest that comes from knowing that God is in control and from knowing that I am not in control. As much as I want to be in control, rarely me controlling my circumstances brings about peace. If joy is an outward exuberance because of our redemption in Christ, then peace is the inner calm that comes along with that. If joy is the outward exuberance of salvation in Christ, peace is inner calm. Two, two truths I want us to understand about what peace is not, and these are very, very important for us. First off, peace is not circumstantial. Peace is not based upon the circumstances of what goes uh, on around us. And we're going to talk soon about why, so I'm going to put the why on pause. But I want us to see the disconnect in Jesus' teaching in John chapter 16 between peace and tribulation. In John 16, Jesus says, I have said these things to you that in me, there's the source of peace, and we'll get to that, you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. So he says, I'm telling you these things so that you can have peace in the midst of tribulation. Why is it that we, in the midst of tribulation, if we were to take 2 Corinthians and to see that Paul was beaten, stoned, shipwrecked, whipped, if the guy was, when he came to his, his deathbed, he was crippled and blind, had to have somebody else write his letters for him and had a difficult time even moving from the tribulation that he experienced, far beyond anything that we would experience. How can Christians in foreign countries experiencing incredible tribulation today describe their circumstances with, what, with such joy? 
because of what comes next. Jesus says, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And we're right back to his sovereignty. In the world, you'll have trouble, you'll have tribulation, but don't fret, don't fear, I have overcome the world. I've already won, the battle is done, I am in control, I'm sovereign, and you can have peace in your heart despite tribulation, despite circumstances, despite even execution, knowing that there is nothing that happens outside of my control and I am good. Peace is not circumstantial. And we must understand, secondly, that peace is not partial. God doesn't want to leave us with a semi-dose of peace awaiting the peace in the future. No, God is no more sovereign in eternity than he is now. God is always absolutely sovereign and ultimately and perfectly good. And so his peace, whether we see Jesus partially now in his word and fully in his presence later, is still full. Jesus in John 14, 27 said, peace I leave with you. My peace is. I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Not in part, not to give it and take it away, not with conditions, not with strings attached. Jesus wants us to have peace, trusting in the absolute sovereignty of God. What is the source of peace? Well, I've already mentioned, it's God himself. We saw in... uh, uh, John 16, 33, Jesus said, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. And in Galatians 5, peace is listed as a fruit of the Spirit. Peace isn't something that we can generate outwardly by trying to control our circumstances. But isn't that what we do when we're hurt or when somebody has done something that hurts us or uh, we want to try and self-protect from a world that, that it might be damaging and painful and causes difficulty? We often respond by trying to control our environment, control those around us, control people. But it doesn't work. No amount of exercising control control in our lives is going to bring peace because the only place it's going to lead us to is to show us that we are not sovereign and we don't have control. The more we attempt to control, the more we realize we don't have control of. If you have children, you understand this clearly. The the source of peace is not my controlling of my circumstances. It's the fruit of the spirit from knowing that God is sovereignly in control. But it doesn't just come from God mysteriously and magically. God has given us some indications of what peace, uh, where peace comes from. What is the root of peace? What does peace feed on? Righteousness. There is a clear connection in scripture between righteousness and peace. James 3.18 says that a harvest is, of, of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. In Hebrews 12, 11, in talking about God's discipline of us to bring about righteousness in our life, says this, for the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. When we cultivate sin in our lives, when we're comfortable with worldly things, when we entertain ourselves, it's interesting, uh, well, it's not interesting, this isn't um, an absolute statement, but it seems to me in my experience that the more sin is, uh, the more I'm comfortable with sin in my life, and the more I observe others who are cultivating uh, sin in their lives and an enjoyment of sin, there is a ever-progressing lack of peace. Righteousness is the root of peace. Peace feeds on righteousness. Sin brings death and destruction. Sin breaks relationships. Sin always hurts and destroys. That is the, the exact opposite of peace. Sin brings division between man and man and God and man. And so when we cultivate righteousness, we cultivate peace in relationships, both horizontally and vertical. But how do we do that? How do we cultivate peace in our lives? This is really where I want us to stop and focus for a minute. And the answer is by setting our minds on God. 
by setting our minds on God. I think so many Christians today are seeking peace through emotion. That if, that if we talk about our feelings, if we talk about our emotions, if we have worship that is void of any biblical truth, but is loud and lights and smoke and glitter and every worldly trick is used to try and incite an emotion out of the crowd, then somehow we will find peace. And at the end of a song that's absolutely void of any truth, what do we hear? Well, that really touched my heart. But all that is is evoking an emotional response to a, a style of music or to other outward stimuli. Scripture teaches us that peace comes from a mind set on God. We want peace of mind and peace of heart, but the biblical reality is that our hearts always follow our minds, not vice versa. We're to preach truth to ourselves, Psalm 42. We're to put the gospel in front of us and in our minds day in, day out. And sometimes our hearts follow slowly, but the heart always follows the head. Romans 8, 6 says, For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. To set the mind on that which is sinful, that which is unrighteous, what the word flesh here almost always refers to biblically, is the opposite of life and peace. It is death. But to the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. To the mind set on flesh, death brings anything but peace. It brings terror. It brings fear. But to the mind that is set on the spirit, the only thing death can do, the only thing death can do for the believer in Christ is deliver him to Jesus. There is peace even in death for the mind that is set on Christ. Because where the spirit of life is, there is peace. Isaiah 26, three says, you keep him, there's the source of peace, being God, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts you and their sovereignty. We fix our minds on God. We acknowledge him as sovereign. We understand that we are out of control, that we go to bed every night and while we sleep and are oblivious, the world still turns. People still live. God never sleeps and never slumbers. Peace is cultivated by setting our minds on Christ. It is fed by righteousness and the source of its nutrients is God himself. So what do we do? We become peacemakers. We become peacemakers. This, this is difficult for me. I am not naturally a peacemaker. Some people are. Uh, but here are some things that I just sketched down real quick as thoughts. Give up having to be right. What does it profit to win an argument but lose a friend? What do you really gain there? Sinful pride, being right. But what profit is there in, in, in being right but losing people over it? Secondly, give up having to be heard and listen. Give up having to be heard. Uh, so many times when there is a lack of peace, when there is strife, when there is conflict, it's because we're fighting desperately to be heard. And by heard, what that usually means is for somebody to think the way we want them to think. Right? That doesn't help. We need to give it up. Give up having to be heard. Give up having to be right. Give up having to be served and choose to serve. I think it's easier the, the more we move along in life to think that those younger than us ought to serve us. That's probably not a biblical view. Give up having to be served and serve. Here's one that comes right out of my playbook. Don't avoid people. Don't avoid people. 
Don't pretend like just not ignoring them and ignoring that there's a problem or ignoring whatever the case might be might result in uh, things blowing over. Go make peace. This is Matthew, I think, 8, where Jesus says, if there's something between you and your brother, leave your gift at the altar, go make things right, and then come back. We don't sit back passively hoping that somebody will come to us. We go make peace. We saw this in... Uh, some of the other things we've talked about. Insist on God's way and give up yours. Insist on God's way and give up yours. And then this is the most convicting thought to me probably that I wrote down. Uh, Where this starts is not in the church. It starts in your home. It starts with your spouse, your husband, your wife, your children. It starts by being peacemakers there, by giving up the the necessity to be right, to be heard, to be served, to have things go your way. Another one that we saw, uh, learned recently from a friend is don't take up the offensive, uh, offenses of others. Sometimes it's easy when somebody we care about is hurt to take up their offense against somebody else. And then we end up with sides. Instead of taking up their offense, take them to the cross. Take them to where there is grace. Take them to where forgiveness can be extended. And where even forgiveness can be extended without ever receiving repayment. What payment does Christ accept for extending us forgiveness at the cross? There is no payment that we could repay him. There is no gift we can give him that he has not already given us. This is Romans 11. For from him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. We can't pay him back. Take people to the cross. When people are, when you're offended, when you're hurt, when there might be something in your life that's troubling peace, run to the cross. Run to the cross. I think I may have shared a story one time where a missionary friend of mine, after talking about some difficulties in my life, looked at me and said, you're a blood-sucking leech. It's not the response that I expected, but I was like, thanks, Mike. And he said, no, really, you need to go to the cross where there is an infinite supply of blood to feed your need. We're blood-sucking leeches, and when we turn on each other, we'll just suck the life out of each other. Make a beeline for the cross. Have your needs met there and be freed up. Be a peacemaker. We have so much reason to be at peace. God is sovereign. God is good. God is in control of all things. He is sovereignly working all things to the good. Secondly, we need to cultivate an attitude of thankfulness. Thankfulness is the response due to God from his people. Again, that's Eerdmans. Uh, We're probably gonna, this isn't a word that we really need to define very clearly. We all know what it means to be thankful. There's no magical formula here. But this is simply the response due to God from his people. While obedience may be the first and foremost of the spiritual attitudes, Uh, thankfulness probably ranks a close second. Scripture almost uses thankfulness as a synonym for being a believer. Scripture assumes that if you're saved, you're a thankful person. Conversely, the unsaved person is assumed to be unthankful. In fact, as Paul talks about the ultimate depravity of man in Romans 1, it seems like the greatest indictment he offers up, the lowest of the low, comes in Romans 1.29. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give him thanks. There's almost this synonymous idea of not being a thankful person with not knowing God. For how can you know the sovereign good God of Scripture by which we gain peace and not be thankful? Of all people in the world, Christians have most to be thankful for. Most of the time when somebody asks me these days, how are you? My standard response is usually, well, I'm pretty busy, but things are good. That's a sad response. I was thinking about it. And you know what my response used to be? How's your day or how you doing? I say, you know what? God's on his throne and I'm saved, so it's a good day. 
That's where peace and thankfulness come from. What more do we need to say? When all the tribulation of John 16 is raging around us, if we can say, God is on his throne and I am saved, our peace and our thankfulness should be unshakable. Thankfulness, though commanded in scripture, isn't merely a duty, it's a delight. Uh, When we're thankful, there's joy. When we're unthankful, when we're ungrateful, there's just selfishness and and, uh, self-aggrandizing as we loathe our circumstances. I looked quickly for some biblical reasons to give thanks. This is not an exhaustive list, but these are all pulled directly from Scripture. I'm not going to give verses, but listen to this incredible list. We should be thankful for God's faithfulness, for God's protection, for God's deliverance, for God's judgment, for God's mercy towards sinners, for God's healing, both spiritually and physically, for God's salvation, for his loving kindness, for the body of Christ and the people he's given us, for his victory over death, and most importantly, for God himself, for our Savior Jesus Christ, and for the indwelling Holy Spirit. Uh, Those things ought to leave us with unshakable thanks. We have so much to be thankful for. We've already seen that the purpose of the church, uh, that the thing we exist for, is for the glory of God. Uh, That the church is not an institution for the help of men, but but for the glory of God. And 2 Corinthians 4.15 says this, For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. Notice the connection there between people being saved and receiving grace and being people of thanksgiving. And then thanksgiving results in the glory of God. One of the greatest ways we can glorify God and fulfill our purpose as individuals and a church is to cultivate an attitude of thankfulness especially for the salvation we have in Christ. How often do our prayers revolve around, I wish I, I wish I had, I wish I could, I wish I would, or I wish he, or I wish she, or if I only had. It doesn't work. Our prayers tend to be centered around, Lord, I want, I want, I want, I want, rather than, Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. This is uh, from John MacArthur. Don't complain when you're in bad circumstances. Cultivate a heart of thankfulness. If you're not a thankful person, it's because you think you deserve better circumstances than you have. But if you got what you deserved, you'd be in hell. If you can cultivate a thankful heart, it will help you solve many of your problems or at least help you to stop dwelling on them. Thankfulness probably would solve a whole boatload of our problems, but even if it doesn't solve them, it keeps us from dwelling on them. It forces us to look up and to see what God is doing. Cultivate thankfulness. Cultivate ways to be thankful. Keep a a thanks journal. Pick a few things a day. Pick three things a day to be thankful for. Write them down. Uh, Pick themes. Family, food, provision, creation. And don't repeat it a bunch. You don't want to have at the end of the year, you know, a thousand things written down, but then have most of them be the same because you're thankful for the same things over and over and over again. And don't just write things like, well, my family, my friends, my church. What specifically? Write three things down that you're specifically thankful for from your spouse, from your children, from your church family, from creation, from work, from whatever the case may be. Cultivate an attitude of thankfulness. And I would most certainly say, and I left a lot on the cutting room floor here, but I would, uh, I would say, uh, let thankfulness dominate your prayers. I think, I think the, the heart of thankfulness is forged in the furnace of prayer. Let thankfulness dominate your prayers. Less Lord please and more Lord thank you for. Uh, Bradley, when we, we, in fact, we were eating dinner the other day and he prayed and we were at a restaurant and the whole place just got quiet as he started to pray. But here's how a typical Bradley before meal prayer goes. Lord, help me to obey and thank you for and thank you for and thank you for and thank you for. That kid, four years old, he can pray. He can pray. 
Thanks dominates his prayer. I hope he continues to be dominated in his prayers with thanks. But if God is sovereign and he is good and we have peace, we have an infinite amount of things to be thankful for. God is so good to us and I am so good at looking away from his goodness and looking at the mess that I made. It's easy to walk into a prairie and find the pile of dung when there's just majestic beauty surrounding us. Look up, trust God's goodness. And thirdly, today, this is attitude number nine, is self-discipline. The modern mantra of Christianity is let go and let God. There is nothing biblical about let go and let God. Part of the reason the church is so uh, attracted to this is because what the church wants is a quick fix to sin that requires no work and no labor on my part. We want to put a microwave, we want to put a microwave dinner in the oven and have it, or microwave oven and have it come out instantly. We want to drive through uh, McDonald's and if our food isn't out in 30 seconds, uh, there's going to be hell to pay. You've got to have a free meal just because it took longer than I wanted it to take. Slow computers, slow phones, slow lines, slow drivers on the highway. Uh, I told you a few weeks ago that I was taking to heart uh, the necessity of being obedient. And so I've done my level best to, uh, to follow the speed limit for probably the last month. You want to talk about some angry people on the highway? Drive the speed limit and see what the people behind you will do. We want this quick fix that requires no work and no effort. But honestly, that simply isn't the biblical picture. The biblical picture is full of imagery like running a race, uh, training for a prize, boxing, disciplining ourselves, beating our body into submission, not literally, uh, but, but we're never going to find this quick fix for sin. I read a story from a missionary, I couldn't find the story, who I believe it was in India and was meeting with this leader and the guy asked him, I shared this story before, asked him for the cure for sin and when he picked up his Bible, uh, this tribal leader stopped him and said, no. I don't want that. I want medicine. I want something I can take. I want an easy pill to swallow that's going to fix all my problems. But biblically, it doesn't exist. What is the definition of self-discipline? It's as simple as this. It is as simple as staying away from sin and doing what is right. Interestingly enough, self-control gets listed as the fruit of the Spirit. Well, wait a minute. I thought God was supposed to be in control. God is in control. But God calls us to work, to fight, to put sin to death in our body. John Owens wrote a book called uh, The Mortification of Sin. Tremendous book. Uh, tremendous book on sin. But he says in there, be putting death to sin. He uses the word mortify. You're either mortifying sin or sin is mortifying you. You're either killing sin in your life or sin is killing you. But it, it doesn't go both ways. We are in an active fight against what sin, an active struggle of self-discipline. We're, we're right back to obedience here. Again, looking for the quick fix if we pay too much money to sit in somebody's office for an hour and let them listen to our problems and focus on our sin and observe our sin and coddle our sin and, and, and mull it over with uh, an allegedly Christian psychologist who buys more into secular psychology than biblical truth then ultimately sin is just going to disappear from our lives. It doesn't work that way. There has to be at some point in which in our, life, in our lives we're simply going to say, I know it's not easy, but God is sovereign. My existence is to glorify him. And so I'm going to obey. I'm going to stay away from sin and I'm going to do what's right. 
I'll tell you right now, you're never going to do that if you're feeding your brain HBO and Showtime. It's just not going to happen. You will not feed your mind a steady diet of sin and then wonder why you don't have self-discipline. There is no peace if our mind is not fixed on God and if we're not cultivating righteousness. Don Carson said this. I shared this with the men recently on a Sunday morning. People do not drift towards holiness. Apart from, and I love this term, listen to this, apart from grace-driven effort, apart from grace-driven effort, people do not gravitate towards godliness, prayer, obedience to scripture, faith, and delight in the Lord. We drift towards compromise and call it tolerance. We drift towards disobedience and call it freedom. We drift towards superstition and call it faith. We cherish the indiscipline of lost self-control and call it relaxation. We slouch towards prayerlessness and delude ourselves into thinking we have escaped legalism. We slide towards godlessness and convince ourselves we have been liberated. But that is not the biblical picture that we see from Paul back in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And let's look at this real briefly. Do you not know that in a race, all runners run? We are in a race. And as somebody once said to me recently, it's a timed event. It's coming to an end. We don't have an infinite amount of time in life. We can't put things off till later, hoping they'll happen. We are in the race now. But only one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. Uh, in the 90s, there was a coach, high school football coach here in Oregon, who groomed his son for greatness. No self-control. All of the control was put in place by his father. This kid promptly was recruited to USC, went down to USC, and he didn't last a year. You know what he found? He found out there was such a thing called a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. He was never without one. He had no self-control. He had no ability to regulate himself. His father had stood over him and controlled every little thing for his whole life. And in the end, he had no ability to exercise his own self-control in things. And he was out of the race. Didn't last a year on the team. Turned into this big old fat guy and wasn't, uh, wasn't playing sports anymore. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. One of the things I find very clearly in my life is that a lack of self-control or self-discipline in one thing leads to a lack of self-control and self-discipline in all things. Why do they do it? They do it to receive a perishable wreath. Notice he said, doesn't say that we don't get a wreath, we don't get a prize. It's not that we don't get a trophy. It's just that our trophy is imperishable. This wreath here is the wreath of leaves set on the victor's head that you often see in, in the, the Greek world. Well, it quickly faded and dried up and died and was worthless. Even gold that we hang on athlete's neck today, it's perishable. God is gonna consume the world in fire and when he does, all will be undone. Our wreath, our prize, our victory is imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Discipline is hard work. The love of one worldly thing thing can wreck your training uh, we see very clearly epaphras wrestling for churches in prayer prayer is work bible study done right is some of the hardest work you will ever do in your life 
Ask some of the guys who are studying to preach. It is not just this simple endeavor that doesn't require much. It requires great work. And scripture, uh, as we saw recently on Sunday mornings as well, seems to indicate, Proverbs 2, that scripture is not going to give up its treasure to those who aren't willing to mine after it, who aren't willing to dig for the treasure there. If you just want a simple, quick read over scripture, how to read through your Bible in 10 years plan, You'll never, never understand the riches there. Don't indulge the flesh. Be careful about what you do in your weekend activities, what you sit and watch on a screen, what you read about in a magazine or in a book. We are training for godliness. And 1 Timothy 4.8 tells us that while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in everything every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. And I would add to that that godliness not only holds value for the present life uh, and for the life to come, but that it also results in a, a, a harvest of peace and thankfulness. Father, we pray that by the power of your spirit and by our grace-driven effort, you might cultivate peace in our hearts. That we might find peace in understanding that you are sovereignly in control of all things and that you are good and that you have blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. Cultivate an attitude of thankfulness. Father, I'm reminded even in this moment that 13 times in 13 letters, Paul uh, said that he was thankful to you for the churches to whom he was writing. Father, let us cultivate an attitude of thankfulness for this church, for those around us. An attitude of humility that sees the needs of others, an attitude of love that meets the needs of others, and an attitude of unity that is brought together under the purpose of being a people that exist for your glory. And Father, I pray that you would grace not only this church, uh, but this town we live in with, uh, with a view to your greatness, knowing that that is our highest good. Father, let us take discipline in prayer and discipline in your words seriously. Uh, let us not grow weary of it. Let us not think that we can get caught up in the quick fix, but that we must dig into your word, that we must fight our own flesh, and that though that seems and sounds exhausting, it results in, in a peaceful harvest of righteousness. Uh, form us to that end uh, for your glory and for our good. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen.